Uh, today I'm going to talk about, at least uh, discuss a few examples uh, where we use uh, physical and chemical properties of the extracellular matrix to study the molecular mechanism and to identify new therapeutic targets. Um, as Serena said, uh, our lab has a few different uh, research, uh, research interests. Uh, one is obviously uh, creating biomaterials to understand cell material interaction. Uh, in this case, mostly uh, focusing on a uh, self renewal of stem cells or differentiation of stem cells. And in the recent days, we also started uh, uh, getting involved with the cell transplantation. Um, so in this case, uh, it, this is an example where we create biomaterials to um, generate organs or at least to organoids. Uh, so this is a lung organoid, and this is a skeletal muscle, and this is a bone uh, tissue. Um, so in this case, we are focusing on how cells uh, interact with the ECM and how the uh, physical and chemical properties, one is obviously mechanics, uh, of the ECM are, uh, um, drive various cellular process. So there is a reciprocal interactions between the cells and the ECM, and when perturbed, so for example, in the case of a cancer, you can see the mechanical properties of the tissue increases, or in the case of a scarring or fibrosis, you see increased ECM and also changes in the uh, physical properties. So when perturbed, uh, how that contribute to disease progression? And in that case, we look at the cancer metastasis and fibrosis, a number of technologies we use, and uh, one of them is organoid chip technology or organoid and other platforms, et cetera. Uh, moving forward, we try to understand how we can use these fundamental insights into generating new therapies, uh, for example, resolving fibrosis or promoting bone fracture healing uh, or a treatment for osteoporosis. And in the case of a cell transplantation, we are also looking at the hemophilia. Uh, hemophilia is a factor nine deficiency uh, leading to uh, issues with the clotting, uh, they, they bleed, they don't clot. So we are trying to figure out how we can uh, transplant the uh, liver cells, that is a hepatocytes, uh, whether it's an allogenic or xenogenic, or even a um, IPSA derived, so they can uh, secrete a, a factor nine and thereby uh, uh, mitigate hemophilia. And another area where we have some interest is uh, working on smart materials and technologies. Uh, in this case, we have some interest in self healing hydrogel, soft robot. Uh, here, the idea is that, okay, can we make the materials more smart? Uh, it's all the focus is on soft materials and not on the rigid uh, metals. And I will try to give you an example from each one of these areas. Uh, and you can ask me questions at the end or in between, I'm fine either way. Um, so, as I said, in the case of a cell material interactions, we use biomaterials as an artificial ECM. Uh, here we are uh, creating bio inspired materials or biomaterials with a defined physical and chemical cues. Uh, we recapitulate a tissue specific milieu. And as I said, it is an organoid and microphysiological systems that is more, nothing but uh, organoid and chip technologies. Now, here you can see uh, we are looking at a self renewal of ESCs and IPSCs. Uh, so here the question was that can we replace uh, metrogel with a synthetic material? Like can we create a tissue culture platform that support the ESCs and IPSCs? Uh, here uh, using a material to direct or a culture system to support osteogenic differentiation, myogenic differentiation, and chondrogenic differentiation. Today, in the first half of my talk, I'm going to give you guys some example how we use biomimetic material as a tool to study molecular mechanism, identify new therapeutics, and finally support in-situ tissue repair. Uh, as you all know, uh, if I dissect a tissue, uh, I'm going to see uh, three com key components. Uh, ones are ECM, they could be proteins or polysaccharides, uh, and then the fluid, and then cells, right? Now, most of these tissues, like the brain or heart, you're going to just see organic components like laminin, collagen, uh, hyaluronic acid, chondroitin sulfate, et cetera. Now, if I go to a uh, bone tissue, that is a skeletal tissue, I am also going to see appetite-like minerals. Uh, that means it is a composite material. And first half of the talk, our interest was on appetite-like minerals because there was uh, some unique opportunity for us to understand how these minerals 
contribute to tissue homeostasis. Now, as you all know, uh, initially we thought that uh, the job of ECM is to provide structural support, that is the shape, architecture, etc. Now, in the recent emerging studies, or even the recent years, we know that ECM also provide physical, chemical, and biological cues. Now, as I said, I wanted to, one of our industries mimicking bone ECM. Uh, that is what I'm going to show you an example. And in this case, we are going to mimic the extracellular matrix. And when we talk about the extracellular matrix, I'm just going to focus on calcium phosphate mineral environment. As you all know, bone is a dynamic tissue. Um, so it is highly remodeled. And so the two cell populations that contribute to this process, one is osteoblast that contribute to tissue formation. The other one is osteoclast that contribute to ECM degradation. So we create, that creates a dynamic mineral environment. That means the appetite or the calcium phosphate minerals will dissociate into calcium and phosphate. Uh, so when you have a lot of calcium and phosphate, will re-precipitate back into calcium phosphate minerals. So the idea is to recapitulate dynamic calcium phosphate mineral environment. So we created a biomineralization approach. Um, so created a biomaterial with this dangling side chains. So that to create a, this is a hydrogen. Uh, so this is more like the soft contact lens that you bear, or it is the jelly jello uh, that you can buy from the grocery shop, right? Now, when we expose them into calcium and phosphate ions, uh, the material will, so this, this is the dangling side chain. So this a functional group will bind to calcium, phosphate, and nucleate, and they form a calcium phosphate mineral. Now, we can characterize this calcium phosphate mineral, uh, and in that, this is a number of ways we, are, uh, we can look at their uh, morphology, uh, the crystalline nature, etc. Uh, what we did is that we took these materials and exposed them into uh, different cells. This is a human bone marrow derived progenitor cells, human embryonic stem cells, and human induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, we have cover slit, we have a mineralized material, and we have a non mineralized material. And we throw the cells onto this material. And you can see that this green are uh, cells on the mineralized material. They are all showing the gene expression that shows that they are undergoing osteogenic differentiation, or they are differentiating into osteoblasts. Uh, we also wanted to look at what happens if we transplant these cells. So in this case, uh, this is a non-mineralized no cells. This is mineralized with the no cells and mineralized with the cells. And you can see that when there are no uh, mineralization, we see nothing happening. Like it's just like some deposition. Now, Mineralized material, this is no cells and this is with the cells. Both the cases, we see a very vascularized heart tissue. And uh, when you histologically analyze them, these are nothing but bone tissues. So we also did, uh, did some uh, uh, orthotopic tissue uh, repair. Uh, in this case, we focused on phospholateral fusion. That is the spine uh, fusion. And here we have created a model, use the biomaterial. And you can see that this is post-surgery. This is with the material just soaked in saline. And this is the material soaked in marrow. And this is a sham surgery. And you can see the bone formation in both the cases. Um, so we also have other additional groups like uh, uh, cells and growth factors. In all these cases, we did not see any difference between the biologics. That means the material plus uh, bone marrow cells or growth factors was uh, come, when we compared that to non-biological, that means just the uh, biomaterial solved in um, saline. So that means the synthetic uh, material without the aid of any cells or growth factors managed to recruit whole cells and contribute to bone tissue formation. Uh, we also used this uh, 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 material to support the bone marrow transplantation. In this case, it is an ectopic bone tissue uh, with the donor bone marrow. So here the idea is that, okay, we have a uh, dual compartment structure. Outer layer is the mineralized layer and inner core is more like the bone marrow compartment. Uh, so we leave this acellula. It can recruit the cells after we implant them and form the bone tissue while we can load the inner compartment with bone marrow 
and that can promote a bone tissue formation. Uh, sorry, uh, that can survive as a bone marrow cells and then contribute to uh, uh, bone marrow uh, transplantation. And then you can uh, implant them ectopically, so that is in the abdomen, and this just act as an accessory. So something I would say is just like having a second battery for your iPhone. Uh, so this is showing the pre-implantation dual structures. Uh, this is micro CT and you don't see much uh, signal because even though we mineralize them, the signal is not sufficient to pick up by the micro CT. And this is after six months post-implantation. And you can see they maintain the donut-like shape. That means this is the bone and this is the bone marrow. Uh, we did an additional analysis and it shows that the outer layer stays as contribute to the bone formation and the inside is the bone marrow that can support the donor cells and also recruit cells from the host and they are completely anastomized. Um, so this uh, prompted us to understand the molecular mechanism by which the minerals promote uh, bone formation or gives bone-like functions. As I said, uh, we have created this biomaterial to have a pool of calcium and phosphate minerals at the outside. So we have a higher concentration of calcium and phosphate ions. Um, see, if you look at the literature, there's a lot of uh, data with the calcium. So we said, okay, we should definitely look into phosphate ions. So we started working on how the phosphate, how calcium phosphate minerals contribute to phosphate ion formation and how that contributes to bone formation. And uh, so there is a cell surface transporter uh, that is called SLCA20. So this is the uh, phosphate transporter. So we started looking at SLCA20. And when you culture the cells on mineralized material, you see the expression, higher expression of SLCA20. And this is the protein level expression. Now, uh, we started looking at the, we wanted to look at how the phosphate ions uh, contribute to bone tissue formation. We said, okay, now we know the transporter. So why don't we perturb the transporter and look at this uh, connection between the phosphate ions and the osteogenesis. And so we have scrambled ion, scrambled SARNA, sorry. This is SSA 21 SARNA. And you can see that uh, compared to non-mineralized material, we have higher level of SSA 21 on mineralized material with SARNA, we can knock down that expression level. Uh, when we do that, the osteopondin and osteocalcin level also goes down. So this is on the mineralized material. Now, we also looked at osteocalcin, the protein level, uh, not much on the non-mineralized. You can see higher level mineralized, no effect from scrambled SARNA. With SSA 21 SARNA, we see the level going down. So that means mineralized material assisted osteogenic differentiation was diminished upon SSA 21 knockdown. Uh, since the phosphate can uh, uh, uptake and contribute to intracellular phosphate, uh, we also looked at the level of intracellular more phosphate, and this is on the mineralized material. And you can see with SSA 21 that goes down. This is intramitochondrial phosphate. Again, the level goes down. Uh, since phosphate is a precursor for ATP, we also looked at the ATP level. We see the same effect, and this is looking at the quanacrine staining for intravesicular ATP. We see exactly the same effect. Um, then we started looking at extracellular ATP as a signaling. So whenever you have a lot of intracellular ATP, they get secreted into the extracellular space and act as a signaling molecule. So we started looking at extracellular ATP as a signaling molecule. And so we used N needle malamide, uh, that is a chemical inhibitor that can uh, block the transport of ATP. And you can see that whenever we block the transport of ATP, we see a down regulation of osteocalcin, osteopondin, and that is true with the, um, the osteocalcin uh, as a protein level too. So extra, extracellular ATP act as a signaling molecule through purinergic receptor. So we started looking at the purinergic receptor. So suramin is a pharmacological inhibitor uh, targeting the suramin uh, receptor. So here you can see mineralized material and uh, without and with the suramin, and we don't see any effect. So we started looking at the, uh, the level of uh, ATP in the medium. 
and we see no detectable level of ATP in the extracellular milieu. Okay, now the question is that, so what is happening? So you have a phosphate ions contributing to the cell. There is a lot of intracellular ATP. They are getting secreted into the outer space. So that is extracellular ATP. Now this extracellular ATP can be metabolized into adenosine. So we said, okay, now let us look at adenosine level. So we started looking at adenosine. So you can see this is mineralized material, higher level of adenosine. When we treat with SIRNA, this level goes down. And we also see the, this is just by the, con, the concentration of extracellular adenosine in the medium. So we were managed to detect extracellular adenosine now in the medium. So we wanted to look at the role of adenosine. So we looked at A1 receptor and A2B receptor. And so you can see that when we perturb the A1 receptor, we don't see any effect. With A2B receptor, we see a down regulation of osteogenesis, that is osteocalcin. This tells us that adenosine is acting as a signaling molecule. If this is indeed true, we should be able to get a non-mineralized material, which does not have any effect on promoting osteogenesis, add adenosine into the medium, and we should be able to see an osteogenic differentiation. So that is exactly what we did. So you can see that this is non-mineralized material. This is mineralized material. When, when we add adenosine into the medium, the osteocalcin level goes up. Uh, when we target uh, A1 receptor, we don't see any effect. When we target A2B receptor, the level goes down. We did the same with osteocondin. We also look the same in the case of osteocalcin expression. And the findings shows that pharmacological inhibition of A2B receptor downregulate mineralized material and exogenous adenosine-mediated osteogenic differentiation. Uh, then we ask the question, is that, okay, can we use adenosine as a signaling molecule to promote osteogenic differentiation of embryonic stem cells and iPSs? So this is the growth medium. You, you see no differentiation. When we add adenosine into the media, we see that positive osteocalcin, and we also see this mineral deposition showing that the cells are indeed differentiating into osteoblasts. Um, so we proposed a new molecular mechanism. You have a biomineralized material. They dissociate into calcium and phosphate ions. The phosphate transport is assisted by SSA 21 that contribute to intracellular ATP, which is secreted outside, and now extracellular ATP that is metabolized into adenosine and that as an autocrine or paracrine molecule through A2B receptor supporting osteogenic differentiation. We also looked at this uh, effect of this pathway. Uh, in fact, sorry, before that, uh, in fact, uh, after our publication, uh, there are some studies using ATP receptor knockout mice. Uh, in fact, ATP receptor knockout mice display low bone density. That means they're more like osteoporosis. And also, if you take the stem cells from the bone marrow and uh, differentiate them into osteoblasts, they have less ability to differentiate into osteoblasts. So that was very, uh, um, like we were very happy. That was very, um, uh, very good news because whatever we identified with the biomaterial now can be proven by uh, animal studies. Uh, as I said in the before, we also looked at the effect of ATP pathway on a fat formation or adipogenesis. So what we did is that we took the mineralized material, uh, cultured the cells, and also cultured them in adipogenic inducing medium. So we are giving two signals. One is from the material for a pushing the uh, osteoblast differentiation and the media more for forming fat formation, right? So we have known mineralized as control, mineralized as a, and then cover slip. And you can see the cells on non-mineralized and cover slip are positive for perlipid. That means they are indeed forming fat. Now the cells on the mineralized material, we don't see any such signal. Instead, the cells on the mineralized material still shows osteocalcin staining that means they are differentiating into osteoblasts. So we block the A2B receptor. And when you block the A2B receptor, the cells on the mineralized material undergo fat formation. It tells us that activation of A2B receptor promotes bond formation and its inhibition leads to fat formation. 
Then we wanted to look at how we can use this adenosine signaling towards bone healing. Uh, as you all know, adenosine is a ubiquitous molecule, so you will have receptor all over the body. So we have to localize the action, localize the drug to avoid side effects. So first we asked is that since it is a naturally occurring molecule, can we leverage endogenous adenosine? However, that is challenging because you have low levels of adenosine in most tissues and especially in the bone tissue. And also adenosine is very transient, less than 10 seconds in circulation. So we wanted to prove that how that works. So we looked at the uh, adenosine level in the tissue, but we know that when they are not fractured, you pretty much have very less adenosine in the tissue. There is not much. However, whenever the cells are in stress or you induce an injury, they will secrete a loss of, lot of extracellular adenosine. So you will see an increase in adenosine level following injury. So in fact, uh, that is what we did. So you can see that there is a almost a, this is pre-fracture and this is a following post-fracture. And you see a tenfold increase in adenos, extracellular adenosine following fracture. So we cover, created a patch and an injectable formulation to sequester adenosine or deliver adenosine. So this is the patch idea. Uh, so we created a biomaterial that can sequester adenosine following injury. So this is just showing that data. We also created a uh, injectable system. Uh, so we can just inject them into the, into the fracture site following injury with or without uh, adenosine, uh, depending upon the age or the uh, disease condition for promoting fracture healing. Uh, so this is one data showing that uh, here we have a controlled material, no adenosine sequestration. Here adenosine sequestration, here adenosine delivery. And you, this is, we are now following this fracture healing. So you can see the fracture. This is the fracture and 14 day and 21 day. So after 21 day, I'm just showing you the data for 21 days. You can see that the control, there is less fracture healing. Uh, when you sequence to the adenosine, the fracture healing improves. And with adenosine delivery, we can even further accelerate uh, fracture healing. Uh, whenever you manipulate the adenosine signaling, we also see uh, promote uh, and uh, increased angiogenesis, and especially in the early days, seven days and 14 days, you can see uh, the materials like which uh, localize adenosine, promote uh, angio have increased angiogenesis compared to the control, and by 21 days, that uh, difference disappears. Uh, we started also looking at the role of extracellular adenosine in bone health. Uh, mainly using osteoporosis because of its uh, prevalence among uh, aged population. And so we used an over-optimized mice and uh, we noticed that uh, the estrocell adenosine concentration goes down in the case of an over-optimized mice compared to a sham mice. And this is also connected to estrogen. So we have also proved that there is a link between uh, decreased estrocell adenosine and estrogen. Um, Osteoporosis, as you all know, is characterized by low bone mass. Uh, so patients with osteoporosis, you see an imbalance uh, between bone formation and uh, bone uh, resorption, and you see an increased osteoclast activity. So most of the drug today uh, is a bisphosphonate-based drugs that decrease bone resorption. Uh, that means to decrease the, uh, the bone degeneration. So we, wanted, we know that the adenosine promote bone formation, but we don't know much about the bone resorption. So we started looking at what the effect of estrocell adenosine in osteoclastogenesis. Osteoclasts are the ones which promote or contribute to bone resorption. And this is a bunch of data, I'm not going into detail. And we also look at the role of A2BR. And we noticed that uh, while it activate osteoblast function, the estrocell adenosine down-regulate osteoclastogenesis. That means it will decrease bone resorption. So we now have an osteoanabolic molecule which promote bone formation and decrease bone resorption. So we wanted to uh, promote use adenosine signaling to look at or see whether we can use adenosine as a therapeutic molecule to treat osteoporosis. 
Um, so in this case, we have to do a systemic administration. Uh, so we have created a uh, nano carrier, uh, which is bifunctional. So the nano carrier that have one functional group that can bind to the bone and then have another functional group that will bind to adenosine. So we can have a, this is a bifunctional group. So we can at least try to achieve targeted delivery of adenosine. Uh, so this is a control. Uh, that means the mice with no uh, pathology, OVH, that means we remove the ovary, so they display uh, bone degeneration, so you can see that it is much more porous. Um, OH, that is a nano carrier, no drug, and OH is the nano carrier plus adenosine. And this is a lot of graphs, I'm just going to uh, guide you through this. Uh, you can see that when you treat the mice with the adenosine, you can see that the BMD, that is the bone mineral density, is very now become very similar to control. We see the same with the bone volume, the control that is a healthy one, and the treated one is very similar. Same for trabecular number, trabecular thickness, connective tissue density, and even the uh, trabecular space. So that means when we treat them with adenosine, because it is an osteoanabolic molecule, it not only slows down the bone resorption, but it also contributes to the formation of the bone tissue. So you get more to the control side. So it's more like reversing the disease and getting into much more like a healthy tissue. Um, so this is some of our study with the starting from a biomaterial, identifying a mechanism, and then going into a therapeutic phase, right? Now, I'm also going to show that the second aspect, how would we use these understandings to um, to, uh, to identify disease progression. As I said, in this case, uh, we look at uh, cancer uh, progression fibrosis. I'm going to mainly focus on the fibrosis side. So as you all know, um, so this is a perfectly healthy tissue and we are just going to look at the wound healing process. We are perturbing this process. And when you perturb them, the quiescent, myofibr sorry, quiescent fibroblasts get activated into myofibroblasts. So you can see they are proliferated, you have more numbers, and they start secreting collagen and other ECM. So there is a higher ECM synthesis. So this changes in ECM, that means you have higher ECM, that means it will also change in stiffness, et cetera. Now, whenever you have this, after this process, you have an ECM remodeling, and this ECM remodeling, uh, brings back to the homeostasis stage. So the myofibroblast goes back to the quiescent stage and the tissue is healed, perfect, right? But now, if this remodeling phase is perturbed, then what you see is that you will have more and more ECM synthesis contributing to scarring or fibrosis. So our question is that, can we target the ECM to resolve fibrosis? So we looked in, the in vitro studies were not sufficient to prove this concept. So we used as transgenic mice. So this is a snail transgenic mice, which would display skin fibrosis. Uh, so you have a, uh, the snail is in the epidermis, uh, the activation introduction of snail will uh, activate the fibroblast in the dermis and it will contribute to fibrosis if, if so. The snail uh, is known to play a key role in EMT. Uh, this is present in many, uh, cutaneous cancers and promoting cancer metastasis, uh, present in scleroderma, et cetera. So that is the reason why we used it. So uh, this is the control wild type, and this is the snail transgenic mice. And so this is the epidermis, and this is the dermis. And you can see the thickness of the dermis is increasing in the case of snail transgenic mice. In fact, that is a characteristic of scarring or fibrosis. Um, so this is just giving a number to that. Now, since there is a scarring, uh, there is a higher level of ECM. So we first looked at the fibroblast, especially activated fibroblast, that is the myofibroblast. So we stained them for smooth muscle acting. This is wild type and this is snail transgenic. And you see higher level of SMA positive cells in snail. Um, concomitant with this activated uh, fibroblast, you see a higher level of collagen in the case of transgenic mice. So this is the collagen deposition. Uh, since it is a skin, there is all another key uh, ECM in skin is a elastic fiber or elastin. So we also looked at the elastic fiber and elastin. You see higher level in the case of transgenic mice. 
Um, this is just looking at the stiffness and also quantifying the higher level of uh, ECM. So this is looking at elastin content. This is the collagen content and looking at the tissue stiffness at uh, various uh, strains. Uh, so we know that there is a higher ECM. So one of the question is that, okay, can we normalize the ECM content? So that means, can we remove the extra collagen and extra elastin? Would that allow this um, uh, process to be balanced and thereby we can reverse the uh, disease? Um, so as you know that removing collagen or elastin is not a trivial task. They are key components of the ECM and needed for uh, skin, so we may not succeed. So we asked the question is that, can we identify other molecules that contribute to the tissue process, the disease indirectly by binding to collagen or elastin. So we have done a condition medium and then a mass spec analysis, and we had a bunch of candidates, but we looked at fibrillin-5. So fibrillin-5 is a molecule that can promote, a, um, uh, that can contribute to elastic fiber assembly, but not that much uh, play a role in collagen. So we said, but the, the reason why we went with the fibrillin-5 is that there is a lot of data looking at the collagen and fibrosis, but not much with other proteins. So this gives us a unique opportunity to understand the contribution of non-collagen proteins into fibrosis. And because fibrillin-5 can directly uh, connect with the elastic fiber assembly. So we looked at the uh, fibrillin-5 level in this uh, transgenic mice. So you see higher level of fibrillin-5 in transgenic mice. This is just looking at the same thing in Western blood. Um, so when we submitted this paper, the reviewer came back and said that, okay, this is good. You have shown a new molecular player in a mice. What about in human? So we have to get human tissues and look at the level of fibrillin-5 in human disease. And so this is in the human disease. You see higher level of fibrillin-5 and uh, in the uh, scleroderma patients, human patients. So now we ask the question is that, can we portray the ECM level, so the especially elastin level through fibrillin-5? So what happens if I take the fibrillin-5 out, would that contribute to normalizing the elastin level? So that was the question. So we, in order to uh, achieve this, we got a fibrillin-5 mice, and this is from, uh, my, from a Japanese group. And what we did is that we took the transgenic mice, that is a snail transgenic mice, and crossed with the fibrillin-5 knockout mice. And what we saw is a complete absence of fibrosis. And uh, so the loss of fibrillin-5, so you can see that uh, this is the wild type. And this is a snail transgenic mice knockout with the fibrillin-5, and this is snail transgenic mice. And you can see that the elastin content goes down. And also the stiffness goes down. So this is very similar to wild type now. Uh, same with the dermal thickness. We look at the myofibroblast, the same. Uh, fibrillin-5 knockout mice have a decreased level of SMA positive cells. And we also look at inflammation. So this is MAC1. Uh, we see the same. When you depletion of fibrillin-5, uh, shows the decreased number of C MAC1 cells, the same for CD3 cells. So we see a uh, the depletion of fibrillin-5 mitigates inflammation. And we also looked at NF-kappa B pathway. We see the same thing. This is the phosphorylation of NF-kappa NF B. And we see that uh, depletion of fibrillin-5 alleviates inflammation. So we proposed a new mechanism. So you have a uh, tissue in homeostasis, and now you have an injury, you are perturbing this homeostasis, uh, that will uh, activate inflammation, uh, and then also activate fibroblast to myofibroblast. So the inflammation feeds the fibroblast to stay as an activator level, and higher level of, uh, or activated fibroblast contribute to ECM stiffness, and this stiffness can also contribute to uh, to maintaining higher level of inflammation. And so there is a positive, uh, for, uh, positive feedback loop that con uh, connecting fibroblast stiffness and inflammation, maintain this process and contributing to fibrosis. Now, I told you guys with a lot of examples that 
we are very good in treating mice so this is my favorite saying if you have cancer in this case in our case osteoporosis fibrosis everything uh, and you are a mouse we can take good care of you so moving forward we started working a lot on organ on a chip platform uh, the idea of the organ on a chip platform is that you can uh, model disease and health by using human cells so here the idea is that you have a patient come into the hospital you take their peripheral blood convert the peripheral blood into an ipscs then you can create patient specific lung heart brain all those organs and then you can connect them and now you have a human or you on a chip platform that can be leveraged to uh, to identify personalized medicine or at least understand the mechanisms so in fact this is a vascularized liver tissues and here this is not blood this is just for the purpose of displaying uh, this is a viscosity matched fluid uh, with the colored red so you can see that we can perfuse them and you can look at the interactions with the tissues and the transport etc uh, this is a cardiac micro tissue and you can see that uh, we can count the beating frequency so this is the control uh, so we can count uh, and now we can uh, expose this uh, tissue to a drug in this case we used epinephrine which is known to increase the amplitude and frequency of beating and that is what you see this in the red curve so you can see that now we can count how this tissue sorry we can study how this tissue respond to a small molecule or a drug now you can wash it off and introduce this tissue to another drug etc and this is a skeletal muscle on a chip here we are trying to understand it how we can introduce injury and then the stem cells and see how the stem cells will incorporate into the, the skeletal muscle tissue and how that contribute to tissue repair and this is in fact a, a multicellular system uh, not just a, uh, looking at just one cell uh, so this is a tumor uh, where we have a cancer monocytes and the endothelial cells here looking at how the interactions between the tumor and the tumor associated micro environment contribute to tumor progression and also study how that will influence the uh, recruitment of T cells. Now we have also have a lung on a chip, which I did not put together because of uh, time constraint, where we are looking at how we can study COVID infection to lung epithelial cells and how especially AT2 cells, that is a type two alveolar epithelial cells and how that contribute to uh, uh, various uh, extent of disease progression, especially the uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection in the human. As I said, the other area where we are interested in smart materials, and here I'm just showing to going to show you one idea of a self-healing hydrogels. So you can see that these are two hydrogels uh, with exposing them to a pH, which we use as a stimuli. We can make them stick to each other. Here you see a, a bunch of pieces. Uh, hydrogel pieces which are sticking to each other and you can see that they can hold their weight um, and this is a three-piece hydrogel uh, you can see that we are stretching them the middle piece is getting stretched but it tolerates the stretch and doesn't break and in fact this video shows that how the how fast the cell feeling and how strong the interface is these are the two hydrogel pieces we are taking we are they are coming in contact with each other and you can see that now we are repeatedly stretching them and even with that repeated stretch you the, you can see the interface is pretty strong and does not break and it is also when we leave them you can see it's very much like an elastomer right so it just goes back and uh, now we are using this concept to create a self-repairing implants and in fact one area we are uh, uh, focusing on self-healing ha lubricants ha is hyaluronic acid so we are creating a material that can form uh, uh, network formation via physical cross-linking, self-healing and self-repair, and this method is shear thinning, promo which promote injectability and lubrication. Uh, we also started using some of these uh, smart, soft hydrogel materials or elastomers for creating a multifunctional soft robot. Uh, here the multifunction means uh, this robot can sense the pH and change the direction of the movement, and here we uh, create a self-healing wing. So the wing movement changes and that makes them to sense the environment, especially the pH, and then change its motion. 
um, we can have a uh, drive this into a right turn, left turn, straight, etc. So there is a user control locomotion where you are driving it, and then you it also has a sense its environment, adapt to it, and then changes the motion that is responding to pH. Uh, we also made this dragonfly or a drabot. Uh, it's a shaped dragonfly, uh, so call it drabot. Um, temperature sensing. So when the temperature changes, uh, it change the wing, the color of the wing changes. So you can see that there is a change in the temperature. We also have some domains of this uh, soft robot, uh, super hydrophobic with the micro architectures that allow them to sense oil contamination. In this case, we use oil contamination. Any hydrophobic impurities will be uh, the they will be uh, the robot will be able to send, uh, to detect any hydrophobic impurities and in this case it's oil contamination and you can see here is the uh, robot moving and so uh, in this case we use a tether because we are using air to uh, say energy and uh, this is showing the multi uh, multiple movement like how the complex motion like a slithering or just uh, uh, skimming over water surface with that i'm not going to give a conclusion slide i'm just going to conclude so that you can ask me questions. Um, I, I'm very lucky to have a very smart, very driven uh, group of students. And uh, so what I did like uh, any PI is that taking their data, uh, putting it together and uh, presenting it. So all the credit goes to my group. Um, and I'm extremely uh, lucky to have a wonderful group of students. With that, I would like to stop here, take questions. And my sincere apologies, apologies for speaking so fast and covering so many stuff. I just wanted to give you a flair of things that we do so you can ask me questions.